Welcome to Sitcom Showdown, a podcast that reviews classic sitcom episodes and inducts them into our very own Hall of Fame. As usual, one of us has chosen a sitcom episode and the other guy has no idea what it's going to be. Will they already know it? Will they love it? Can they be convinced that it's worthy? Let's find out on the Sitcom Showdown. Hello and welcome to Sitcom Showdown number 80. A uh, nice round number. Uh, hello, Steve. Hello, Jeff. Oh, we're back. It's good to be back. It is good to be back after not really a hiatus, but sort of. Yes, I was busy doing podcasts on the 50th anniversary of the goodies over on my other podcast. And uh, so then poor old sitcom showdown got pushed aside for a little bit. Yeah, we're still making it uh, in yeah. just in the nick of time Yeah, for a November episode. So Excellent. That's good. Did you see there's a new Vicar of Dibley is there really? Coming out, yeah. No, I didn't see this. All right, news alert. Do, 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 of do, course, do, it's do. going to be minus Alice and a couple of others. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's on the cards, apparently. Are we talking Richard Curtis here? And oh, I don't know about the writer. Stuff, okay. Well, it's a step in the right direction, isn't it? Mm, you'd hope so. Mm. You'd hope it's going to have him in it. Yeah. Attached to it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Uh, all right, I'll look forward to that then. Yes. Mm. And uh, what have you got for us? Oh, right. Uh, yeah, November. look, I've got a, got a classic old sitcom which finished before you or I were even born, Steve. Ooh. Wow. Yes. That, well. <laughs> so let me run some names by you. Not sure what to say about that. <laughs> Colonel Clink. Ah. And Schultz. I know nothing. Yes. Very good. Yes. Hogan's so Heroes. We'll be looking at Hogan's Heroes. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Nice so, one. Yeah. Oh, wow, thank you. Oh, we can wrap up the show now and just say <laughs> into the Hall of Fame. Um, the story behind this is, I was searching out bargains, and I found this one for a in perfect condition for a measly buck. Well, this DVD, what, a I whole thought, a whole season or no, no, just a box four, set or... four episodes. Yep, yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll have a go on that. Have a crack and, at that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so it's Hogan's Heroes' turn. So we're going to be looking at episode seven of series one. Uh, which came out in 1965, mm-hmm. and it's called "German Bridge Is Falling Down." Mm. Ah. Yeah. Um, so the one line summary of this episode yep. is after an Allied bombing mission fails to take out the Adolf Hitler bridge, Hogan's team <laughs> robs the Stalag 13 arsenal to get the job done via sabotage. Nice one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. The Adolf Hitler bridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, he might as well name bridges after yeah, himself. Probably every every bridge in Germany was called the Adolf Hitler bridge. <laughs> yes, that's exactly in- right. Back in those days? I reckon so. Yeah. Like every town in Western Australia has a Throssell Street or Throssell Avenue or something like that. Does it? Named after some bloke back in the day who mm. presumably named all the streets. Adolf Throssell. <laughs> that, that's him. <laughs> oh. uh, what are your memories of Hogan's Heroes, Steve, if you've got any? Well, I can't say I ever watched it from start to finish or anything like that, but bumped into it from time to time on commercial TV. Yeah. Would have been Channel 9, I think. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah, it does sound right. Hmm. Yeah, yeah certainly not on the ABC. Reruns after reruns of it, I would say. Yes. Uh, I've got it elsewhere in my notes that I always remember it being there. You know, you'd see Hogan's Heroes, and then they'd throw in some Gilligan's Island, and then after that you might get some, uh, you know, Mikhail's Navy. I was thinking Bewitched. Oh, be Bewitched, somewhere yeah, in that, yeah. That line up. Good call. Uh, um, all right, well, while you check that little message, I'm going to yes. launch into the description of the sitcom. Good For anyone not familiar with Hogan's Heroes, Hogan's Heroes is an American television sitcom set in a Nazi prisoner of war camp during World War II. Now, it ran for a, a whopping 168 episodes, which is huge, Whoa. Yeah, in six seasons, uh, from September 1965 to April 1971 on the CBS network. Um hmm. Now, the Hogan of Hogan's Heroes is a U.S. Army Air Forces colonel, and his name is Robert Hogan. Uh, He's got this crew of expert operatives with him in the camp, and they want to be there because they're, you know, carrying out all these um, sort of espionage, resistancy, intelligency Mm. sort of operations from inside the camp, inside the fictional Stalag 13. Are you saying they got there by... Did they get there by chance, or was there some kind of a plan to bring them together? Yeah, I don't know. I guess they decided they were good at this thing and it was working and so the various allied forces said why don't you stay there boys yep and do a bit of this that and all the rest of it i don't know i I didn't watch the pilot (laughs) um anyway they're skilled guys from all over the world yeah anyway so this stalag 13 
Um, they don't really say where in Nazi Germany it is, but it always seems to be winter. Um, and it's run by the incompetent Commandant Colonel Klink and his main man, Sergeant Schultz. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who is a bit thick. Um, Klink has no clue about the highly organized resistance crew inside his camp. And Starlog 13, thanks to the genius of Colonel Klink, has a uh, unblemished record of zero escapes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so Hogan and his men, they, um, they try to maintain this record so they can continue their operations. Um, now, with Starlog 13 being so safe, and impregnable, yep. so to speak, uh, from the inside. Anyway, so the the Nazis tend to see it as this um, super safe camp, and then they conduct their high level meetings there, or <laughs> um, develop secret projects there, and all this sort of stuff. You know, so it's um, it works both ways. It's pretty cool. Anyway, let's move on to the cast. Ooh. Yes, Bob Crane plays Hogan, the senior ranking prisoner of war in the camp, and uh, he uses his wit and ingenuity. Hogan does to counter the Nazis' battle plans. Now, Bob Crane, he was offered the role after appearing as a sort of guy next door type in all sorts of television shows like the Dick Van Dyke show and so on. Oh, um, well-known one. Yeah. I mean, we all know he was a very charismatic guy. And as far as awards go, he was nominated twice for an Emmy. Never won one. Uh, he was nominated twice for Best Actor in a Comedy Series for this show in 66 and 67. Hmm. And, and we know he didn't win, but the next actor did. The great Werner Klemperer plays Colonel Wilhelm Klink, the commandant of the POW camp. In real life, he was from a Jewish family who fled Nazi Germany in 1933. Um, And he once said that his only rule when he took the role is, if the writers ever try to write an episode where Colonel Klink comes out as the hero, then he would leave the show. Um, And he, in fact, you know, Werner Klemper, he won (coughs) two Emmy Awards for Best Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. In 1968 and 1969. So we're never going to get the episode of Hogan's Heroes where occasionally, just occasionally, Colonel Clint gets a win out of this situation. Yeah. That's a shame in some ways because they're sometimes the best episodes. Yeah. Well, would you like to see um, General Melshit get a win? In No, but in I'm like thinking a- of Yes Minister. Occasionally, oh, God, yeah. occasionally the minister would put one over Sir Humphrey and you'd be going, yes! <laughs> yeah. Oh, we can... But let's think about yeah, that. A he bit wasn't a Nazi, on. so yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, now, the, a chappy called John Banner was Sergeant Schultz, um, the camp sergeant at arms, who's a clumsy, inept, but extremely affable chappy, who often gives out information to the prisoners in return for bribes, um, and the bribes are usually Lebeau's gourmet cooking. Mm. Uh, who could turn that down during wartime? Um, now in real life, John Banner was born to Jewish parents as well, and he was, in fact, a sergeant during World War II, Whoa. but for the U.S. Army. Huh. Now, we mentioned LeBeau a minute ago. Yes. Um, he's often people's favorite. Um, Robert Clary, that's who he is. Uh, he plays LeBeau, who's a gourmet chef and a patriotic Frenchman, uh, and he also specializes in training up the camp guard dogs. Uh, to be friendly towards the prisoners, and that's how they use the dog's <laughs> kennels. You know, they lift up the dog kennels and get into their secret network of tunnels. Um, it's not Pepe, Pepe LeBeau, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's Louis, <laughs> Louis LeBeau. Um, anyhow, uh, he's he's another Jewish chappy in real life. He's the only guy still alive from the cast. I think he's 94. Whoa. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, he was in a Nazi concentration camp uh, in reality, but he survived by using what? his t- talent for singing and dancing. So yeah. did I miss what nationality he is? He is, in fact, French. He's a bona fide Frenchie. I think he's a bona fide Frenchie. I didn't actually nice. put that in the notes. Yes. So as we're going to find out in a minute when we get to the British chappy, you know, they call him British American, but you know, he was born and raised and started his career in England and such. And this is interesting. It is interesting. Anyway, yes, we we're just talking about Corporal Newkirk, um, and that's played by Richard Dawson, and he's like the con man, magician, mm-hmm. pickpocket, card sharp, all the dodgy stuff. He's the um, yeah. What's know. the equivalent from Dad's Army that we were talking about well, not long ago? <laughs> Private Walker. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if we we're doing Blake Seven, he'd if you want be some villa. fish and chips. <laughs> He's yeah, a man. That's, that's, that's right. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, he's also a skilled tailor, and he, he makes uniforms for POWs impersonating high-ranking German officials. But anyway, in real life, Dawson, um, he got the spot in Hogan's Heroes 
from being in a film called King Rat. Mm. Oh, which I have no nothing. That sounds about. a bit. Um, yeah, isn't that a well-known film? Could be. Could be. Um, Ivan Dixon. Now he is Staff Sergeant James Kinch. They all call him Kinch. Uh, he's the communications guru, right? Yep. And so he can. Uh, well, he uses all sorts of equipment to get messages through in, in different ways. So he contacts the underground um, using either Morse code or telephones or the coffee pot radio uh, to receive and transmit. Um, now, in real life, Ivan Dixon, the actor, was an African-American actor, and he kind of led the way a bit in some regards, being cast as a, a very positive uh, main player in this sitcom, which is yep. pretty rare casting back in the 60s. Um, and then lastly, we've got Sergeant Carter, uh, and he's the all American sort of chappy, not in the Colonel Hogan sort of way, but in an, oh, shucks, everyday dude sort uh, of way, okay, you know, yep. yeah, uh, played by Larry Hovis. Um, and he's, he plays a big role in this episode. He's like the chemistry guy, uh, explosive dude and demolitions. So, um, that's what he does. Anyway, Hovis was discovered by the producer of the Andy Griffith show, a bloke called Richard Link and hired him to play a recurring character on another military-type sitcom called Goma Pile USMC. Uh, and then from that, he got this mm-hmm. role as mm-hmm. Sergeant Carter. Very good. Ah. Uh, I like the way they've all got multiple skills and yeah, talents and all that sort of stuff. It's and it's a, cool. a mixed bag of nationalities as well. It's very good for all that sort of stuff, this show, I feel. I reckon we should take in a clip and then go off and watch this show. And because it's quite an involved plot... We're going to have a rather large synopsis. Okay. The Adolf Hitler Bridge is still in business. Yeah, and Klink's happy. Nasty happy. Let's make him unhappy. Nasty unhappy. Let's knock out that bridge. Huh? What? You're kidding. I mean, how do we get there? We'll worry about that later. What kind of explosives have we got, Carter? Three firecrackers and cantilighter fluid. Firecrackers? Well, sure, you remember. You know, we told Clink that LeBeau was part Chinese. We had to have firecrackers to celebrate Chinese New Year. Yeah. And I cooked that whole pot of chow mein with sauerkraut? Please. Not while I'm plotting. You got anything to make explosives? Well, the easiest thing would be some kind of gas. If we could get a detonator and a timer, maybe chlorine gas. What do you need? Ammonia would do it, mixed with bleach if we had any. Hey, the Krauts keep a lot of that stuff in the kitchen for cleaning. Newkirk, go find Schultz. Volunteer for kitchen detail. Yes, Colonel. Kent, you go with Carter. Help him set up his bomb factory in tunnel number three. Get him anything he needs. Right. What, what about me, Colonel? What do I do? LeBeau, my boy, I'm holding you in reserve to make chow mein. What? If Carter's bombs don't do it, we may have to poison that bridge. <laughs> And we're back from watching Hogan's Heroes, Series 1, Episode 7, German Bridge is Falling Down. Uh, any comments before I launch into this, Steve? No, no, I'm looking forward to this synopsis. All right. I, might, be, I might learn a bit. <laughs> yeah. oh, I had to um, stop and ask you about three times, what's going on? Yeah, which is usually not a good sign, but um, we'll talk about the reasons for that later on. Ah, yes. The episode begins with Schultz conducting a nighttime count of the prisoners in Barracks 2, which is where our chaps hang out. Mm. Um Anyway, so outside in the cold, all of Hogan's men are lined up, and uh, the Count, as we find out, was actually asked for by Hogan, uh, because as he puts it to Colonel Clink, you know, he's claiming some of the men, some rogue elements of being thinking of some crazy escape plan, right? and he wants to put a stop to it uh, so that the rest of his crew doesn't get punished. Uh, mm-hmm. It's all bullcrap, of course. Um, anyway, after the Count has been conducted and the prisoners have been put at ease, Clink tells Hogan how appreciative he is of being informed about prisoners' thoughts of escaping. Yes, as you would be. Yeah. And Hogan, as he speaks with Clink, so he tells his men who have been put at ease, you know, right, smoke them if you got them, and all the men light up their ciggies. Yep. And meanwhile, high up in the air, this pilot and co-pilot of a passing American bomber, they see this lighted arrow shape on the ground, um, which is uh, pointing towards a nearby bridge. 
And this plane is the lead plane of a bomber squadron, and uh, of course, going in the direction of the arrow, leading it leads the bombers towards the bridge, and the air uh, are dropping bombs in an attack before heading back to England. Mm. And this is a great little intro scene. It shows us what Hogan's heroes do. Yep. And how Hogan is already manipulating Clink by arranging for this nighttime count and then lighting up the ciggies. Anyway, um, the next day at another parade, Clink informs the prisoners that an attack on the Adolf Hitler Bridge took place overnight, but that the bridge is still standing and was only slightly damaged by the attack. And Clink uses this as an opportunity to gloat about how good the German defences are yep. and presumably how good their bridge engineering is. Yep, those in German engineers. Mm-hmm. You can't beat them. No, you certainly can't. <laughs> anyway, the statement gets a reaction of hoots and hollers and cheek from the prisoners and they're, you know, um, sort of catcalling and, and, and heckling. Uh, so after prisoner Carter, who sort of uh, yells out from the ranks, he goes, we'll get the bridge next time, Fritzy. Anyway, <laughs> Clink demands that the guilty party confess by stepping forward. So, of course, <laughs> yeah. all the men step forward. And he goes, no, no, you get back there. And so they all step forward again. He goes, right, then you're all guilty. And I'm going to close the wreck hole for one week. And Hogan goes, you can't do that. We won't be able to hear our Tommy Dorsey records. It's outrageous. Okay, I won't close it for one week, Clink says. I'll close it for two weeks. And oh, anyway. Yeah, so the wreck hole is now closed for two weeks. Oh, dear. Um, Clink then has the prisoners dismissed. And uh, Hogan's chaps now know that the planes could not destroy the bridge. Now, Hogan steps up at this point and tells his men that they're going to destroy it themselves, which yeah. is bonkers, uh, but very, very ambitious ambitious and brave. So they're sort of all gathered around Hogan saying, come on, dude, how on earth are we going to be able to do this? <laughs> well, they've got his a couple of firecrackers. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Left over from Chinese New Year when they told Clink that Lebo was <laughs> part Chinese, so they needed firecrackers. Yeah. As a... And obviously, Clink's fallen for this, and they used the firecrackers for something, so it's just, ah, fantastic stuff. It's another one of those examples of when you talk about a past adventure, or a a character who's never seen, and your imagination fills in the hilarious gaps. It's pretty cool. Anyway, um, Hogan asks Carter, the chemistry whiz, what sort of explosives they have, and as you said, Steve, it's a couple of firecrackers. So Hogan says, look, dude, I need you to start working on some sort of bomb to blow Mm. up this bridge. So Carter goes, okay, if we can get... Um, you know, some bleach and ammonia and stuff. We can make a chlorine gas bomb. Um, and so that should be in the kitchen, as Kinch says. They've got some of that stuff in there. And so Hogan mm-hmm. decisively says, all right, New Kirk, you go and volunteer for kitchen duty yep. and get us some of this stuff. And like w- within a second, he's out the door volunteering for kitchen duty. So the men are really, they take it seriously. They're oh, well yeah. drilled. But um, yeah, so that's what happens there. And Lebeau, the French cook, asks what he can do because... Uh, you know, the the next instruction that Hogan gives is, all right, can you and Carter go down there and set up a bomb-making lab in Tunnel 3? Mm-hmm. And LeBeau says, what am I going to do? He goes, oh, well, I need you uh, on standby for chow main duty. And he says, what do you mean? He goes, if the bomb doesn't work, we may have to poison the bridge. Yeah. And you said that was a bit harsh, Steve, that he's trashing LeBeau's cooking. Yeah, I think um, yeah. he would be deliberately poisoning yeah. it. <laughs> That's <laughs> not, right. Not accidentally. Yeah. Quite right, quite right. And I have to say, being well out of Tunnel 3 yeah. is probably <laughs> a good thing at this point. As we're soon to find out, yeah. Oh, blimey. Uh, it gets a bit volatile down there. Anyway, from here, uh, and of course we have mentioned that Hogan's crew have this extensive network of tunnels. They mm. can come and go from the camp whenever they want. There's at least three of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, but we do see a diagram later on, and it's it's pretty groovy. Anyway, Clink is signing some requisition forms inside his German office there, and, and Helga's getting him to sign all this paperwork. Schultz comes in, um, and so Helga leaves with the forms, and Colonel Clink asks Schultz about the reaction of the prisoners to the closing of the wreck hole. Mm. And he goes, were they angry? And Schultz says, yes, they've given Clink an unflattering new nickname. And uh, <laughs> then Schultz sort of goes to launch into that. Because he's obviously found it hilarious when the yep, prisoners yep, yep. said it. But um, Clink gets a bit mad. He tells Schultz to go off and check the barracks for any sign of tunnelling activity because now that he's banned the wreck hall, he knows that escape attempts are going to go up because the prisoners are all oh, upset. Disgruntled. Yeah. Th- yes, that's a perfect word for it. And now, as he's telling Schultz all this, as you remarked, Steve, you can hear all these explosions happening nearby. <laughs> and it's completely bonkers. So... Obviously, this, as we know, is 
Carter down in the tunnels mm. testing various levels of chemicals to get the right measures for his explosive. Uh, oh, well, okay, look, I've missed a bit because earlier the experiments to create the bomb did cause an explosion and Carter um, gets blown up a bit and Hogan and Kinch were down there and said, what are you doing, dude? You're going to bring the Germans down here any second. And Hogan says, don't worry, I've got a plan. We're, and they put this sign up. Or can you tell us about the putting well, up of the sign? No, I just love your description. He got blown up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he was a bit singed. And he, yes, and he so was too. Um, in order to make people comfortable with all the explosions that are going to be going on while they're fine-tuning this formula, they hang a sign. Lebeau hangs a sign out on a road. It must be one of the roads on the way into the camp, hmm. which says um, something like, what is it, explosions in the area. Construction Constru- work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's a plausible excuse for these explosions going off. Yep. Back to you. Um, and so yeah, so that was the bit we missed out. And so cutting back to where I was before I realised our mistake, my mistake. They're in the office and they're commenting on all the explosions. And this is where Clink says to Schultz, "Well, you, I mustn't discuss this with you because it's clearly top secret." Now there's a sign outside the camp saying that there's all these explosions happening and construction. Now I phoned Berlin Schultz and they know nothing about it. And this must mean, if they are saying they know nothing about it, that it's top secret and it's probably some sort of intelligence top secret work. Therefore, you mustn't say anything to the prisoners if they ask about all these explosions. Yep. I actually like the way he's not just turned a blind eye to the fact that these explosions are going on, but he's actually investigated it Yep. to the point where he's comfortable with what's going on, even though he's come to... He's got the wrong end of the stick. Completely the wrong, yeah, conclusion yeah. about what's going on. Yeah, this is the thing, is, and, I, and I do bring, I'll bring this up later on, but Clink is not a stupid man. No, he's not. He's a foolish man. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but he's not a stupid man, whereas Schultz is a stupid man. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um. He says to Schultz, if the prisoners ask you about it, you know nothing, you say nothing. And Schultz says, oh, I think I'll be cool to handle that, <laughs> sir. He goes, I know yes, you will. <laughs> <I know." laughs> uh, back in barracks too, some of the prisoners are playing cards and they're hearing these explosions. Um, and then they hear some tapping coming from underneath them on the floorboards. And Newkirk, the British thiefy dude and Kinch, the communications guy, they go over to this suitcase on the floor but we find out that it sits over a tunnel and they open this suitcase and pull the false bottom out of it mm-hmm. and Carter pops up looking very worse for wear and dazed and, yeah. Even more singed than the last time. Oh, absolutely. He's very frazzled. Um, so anyway, uh, they pull him out and sort of tend to his problems <laughs> and the lookouts say, all right, pack it up, guys. Schultz is about to come in. With some other Germans. So the prisoners quickly put Carter in bed and Lebeau's pretending to feed him some medicine. Uh, mm. And Lebeau, as Schultz walks in, tells Schultz that Carter is sick. And uh, the other German guy goes off and starts searching for this increased escape activity that Clink thinks is going to happen. Yep. Um, uh, but Newkirk says, yeah, come over here then, Schultz, and have a round of poker with us, bro, and sort of guides him over. But as we know, he's a sneaky, pickpockety dude, Steve. Yep. And so after Schultz and the other guy leave... Um, we find out that he's lifted some bullets from Schultz uh, out of his, like, ammunition pouch um, just because, you know, he needs to keep his skills up. And then he gets an idea because he sort of says, I wish we had 500 of these. We could make a pretty good bomb by emptying all the gunpowder out of the end of the bullets. Yes, so in between the bloke getting blown up and getting lifted out of the suitcase tunnel... And this conversation that you're talking, or this stealing of the bullets you're talking about yeah. now, did they have a conversation about how they did this plan of using ammonia is just not going to work? Yeah, and and Hogan says that this stuff's clearly so unstable that even if you do get it right, it ain't going to survive a motorcycle ride. You know, several. Yep, we're never going to make it to the bridge to, this stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've got to come up with another plan. And then fortuitously, Newkirk says, I wish we had 500 of these, we can make a bomb. And Hogan says, well, why not? Here's what we're going to do. Okay. Now, is this legit? Could you really do that? (laughs) Oh, I reckon if you've got enough gunpowder, you could rig something up. Okay. Yep, I'll roll with it. Would you mess about with 500 rounds worth of gunpowder or in a past? Okay, I I think that answers that question. But is it enough to blow up the Adolf 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 Hitler Bridge, which has been designed by German engineers? (gasps) Now, this is a good thought. I don't know. All right. It would certainly blow me up. 
Yeah. What, what about, about the bridge? What about the bridge? Good call. Hmm. If only the Mythbusters were still around. Oh, yeah. That would be awesome. Oh, well, we'll just have to take it as read that it could work. Uh, Carry on. Right, so this is kind of setting up the new plan. And uh, if I remember where we are in the plot, then essentially Hogan says, yes, this is a rip-roaring suggestion. All we've got to do is... is, steal um, 500 bullets. (laughs) Yeah. And so here's where the ammo dump is in the camp. Why they keep the ammo dump in the camp and not outside. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So there's a (laughs) building with lots of bullets and bombs in it. And they go, oh, all we've got to do is extend Tunnel 3 a little bit. And then come up from underneath and take the stuff. Mm. And everyone goes, what a spiffing plan, sir. And this is when Carter comes to his senses a bit and says, that last explosion (coughs) sort of collapsed 50 feet of Tunnel 3. Yep. So we're not doing diddly. And now they find themselves in the situation where they can't get in to the ammo building because of the extra crackdown because they're already in trouble over the wreck hut business. You know what I mean? So there's increased vigilance. Yeah, they've got to be the masters of improvisation. Yes, that's right. And Hogan, as always, comes up with a fantastic plan. And he's basically saying, get your paints out, boys. And you and me, as the viewers, are going, ooh, I wonder what they're up to. And then we cut forward to the next day. Schultz is walking the grounds and he comes in sight of the ammunition building, which he sees is covered with all this badly painted insults and graffiti (laughs) And nasty things about Goering and Colonel Clink and well, all this sort of stuff. I couldn't even really comprehend what the one about Clink was. Yeah. What was it? It, it was bu- Colonel uh, Clink is bucking for Ratfink. <laughs> and oh, I don't know what that means, but they're saying such and such is a Ratfink. Let's say it I was. I get that much. Oh, no, Himmler. And then it's Goering is a fat Ratfink. And then Colonel Clink is bucking for Ratfink. So maybe Colonel Clink is aiming to become Ratfink. If he mm. had his way, he'd love to be promoted up to levels like Himmler and Goering, where yep. he could be Ratfink, King he, Ratfink. He aspires to be yes. the Ratfink. Okay, let's let's that, that works. Oh, good. I, I'm glad. <laughs> um, uh, after reading them, he tells Colonel Clink, who is furious, Dave, and uh, he uh, starts yelling at Hogan, saying, "How can your men do this? This is terrible." And Hogan's going, "You know, chill out, dude." They're just upset about the wreck hole situation. Yeah. They're letting off some steam. Don't worry, Colonel. They haven't you heard know, any Tommy sorry. Dorsey for a whole week. Yeah, they, that's exactly right. <laughs> what do you expect? Yeah. And he goes, don't worry, your man will be able to paint this within a day. And Clint goes, my man, my man. A day. Your men are going to paint this. Yeah, exactly. And Hogan's sort of protesting and saying, listen, uh, it's in the Geneva Convention or something that Prisoners of war don't do this sort of thing. Yep. And then he turns to Schultz and he goes, we're going to need a big tarp. And then he <laughs> turns back to Clink and says, there's no way we're going to paint this for you. And turns back to Schultz and says, we're going to need a couple of ladders, really tall ones. And he turns back to Clink and blah, blah, blah. This anyway, is funny. So that it ends up that, yes, they get the job of painting this bloody building, which is how they get there. And they set the tarp up over the entrance of the, of the ammo hut. Mm. And, you know, the, it's a bit later and the boys are painting away. Although they're using thinned down paints. So and no matter how many coats they put on, you yep. can still see. Intentional, of the, course. <laughs> yeah. You can still see the insults, though, because they need a lot of time to empty 500 bullets. I have to say, it looks this building looks very much the part. It's a real bunkery looking concrete type of oh, building. Yeah. There's no, it's not like a wooden hut like the ones that these guys live in. No. Nope. No, it is quite substantial. Quite secure. Yeah. Or is it? No. <laughs> well, so yeah, we've cut to a little bit later, painting's underway, and there's this bit of scaffolding and, you know, the ladders and the tarp. Now, this partially obscures the entrance, Steve, and so what they do is they send Newkirk, who's the king lock pick, under the tarp. He picks the lock, and then he goes into the ammo hut and starts taking apart the bullets and stealing the stuff. Now, they have to change people doing this job quite often not to arouse suspicion. Mm. And there's all these guys going back and forth, carrying bits of stuff. And Schultz is twigging to what's going on. And he's saying there's more traffic here than Berlin. And um, they go, well, there's horrible paint fumes under the tarp, Schultz, you see. And the men get dizzy, so we have to change them out all the time. That's right. They can only paint a little bit of door before they have to go. And someone else takes over. For hours and hours on end. Uh, yes, anyhow, so they've got their access to the building and um, they um, need to stall a bit more, though, because it's taking more time than they thought. But Clink is getting very irate and says, cover up this graffiti now. So they do it and they paint it pink, Steve. <laughs> yes, I like that touch. <laughs> uh, Colonel Clink goes off his nana yep. and says, 
you can't have a pink building in a concentration camp. <laughs> I want this repainted. And so they bring out this yeah. huge... Instantly. <laughs> as if they knew it was going to happen. Yeah. So. It's almost as if they knew yeah. it was going to happen. Uh, like this beautiful colour board. <laughs> it's so a massive that plank of wood, can right? choose a charming shade of chartreuse or whatever. A massive yeah. plank of wood that's covered in... <laughs> All these different types. A dozen of different paint colours. Which I should add, they probably wouldn't have access to anyway. I was going to say, where did they get these paint colours from? Oh, I've got no idea. Where are we? Okay, yeah, so Clinky just says, listen, stop mucking about. I want it painted the same colour as all the other huts in this camp. And stop screwing around, essentially. Yep. Um, But yeah, in a nutshell, they get what they want. They get all the stuff. Um, The gambit with the ammo hut is over, and they've got all their gunpowder. Hooray! Hooray! Um, and so all they've got to do now is whack it in some sort of package and bung a timer on it and all that sort of stuff. Now, I, I was gobsmacked that mm. they'd put so much work into the plan to date, painting the heart, getting all the gunpowder and everything like that. Yep. And then you find out the tenuous nature of the next part of the plan. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, they say they, they pray are, tell us about the next part of the oh, plan. I think they literally just go, look, let's just do this bit. And step, we'll cross step that by, bridge when yeah. we come to it. Let's no take this step by step. Yeah, exactly. We'll figure it out as we go. And and what they figure out is now they have to get the bomb to the bridge, right? So, you know, Kinch is clever. He's hooked up this timer and the box and all the stuff. And they see the courier come in. <clears throat> and they think, oh, yes, now this courier, chappy. And they obviously somehow get the information out of Schultz by outwitting him or bribing him that the courier, you know, he goes over the bridge every day. Mm-hmm. And uh, they cause a distraction. So Lebeau mucks about with this guy's motorcycle, the courier's motorcycle, and they get in a bit of a barney. And while that's going on, um, Newkirk slips the bomb into his sidecar. Yep. Uh, and then, because they've done all the calculations, right? They know it's going to take 25 minutes to get to the bridge. And so they set the timer for, you know, if the. It's very clever because they know that the regulation is that people in army transport in Germany aren't allowed to go over 40 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. But they know that you're going to go right up to 40 miles an hour because you're a young hoon on a motorcycle. Yep, absolutely. So they do the calcs and they know the time. Anyway, this guy had got a bit aggro with Lebeau. So as he's driving off, Schultz comes out and they were saying to Schultz, that courier guy is a real pain in the butt. You know, he's a bit of a scumbag. He got aggro with us. And Schultz says, tell me about it. I wanted him to take a pound of coffee to my wife in Dusseldorf. It's only a minor detour for him, but he charged me 10 marks. And then they go, oh, crap, he's going to Dusseldorf instead of over the bridge. Yeah. Uh, And this throws a massive spanner in the works. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows what they're going to blow up (laughs) if he stays on this road. Oh, that's right. Uh, Now, I swear we're getting towards the end, listeners. How how are they going to turn this around, yeah? Okay. Uh, I can see the end of the page in sight, Steve, so (laughs) don't worry. Okay, so what happens is, and this is one of those genius times where Hogan, and they've got 18 minutes to do this before the bomb blows up. So he goes into Clink's office and comes up with this absolute whopper of a tale saying, listen, I've found out that some of my men have bribed this courier guy to go into Dusseldorf and get a case of your favourite wine to bribe you, Colonel Clink, against all regulations, so that in hopes that you'll open the rec hall. And, you know, if this gets out and the courier goes into town and says that, oh, these guys are paying me bribes and I'm doing the thing, then the Gestapo are going to come down on you. Yep. You've got to stop this now. Uh, because they know that there's like a, um, you know, what would you call it, Steve? Like a guard post on the road for oh, yeah. checking ch- people's checkpoint. Or something. checkpoint. And if they get Clink to telephone checkpoint number nine and tell the guard there to stop the courier, Mm -hmm. then they can stop this sidetrack to Dusseldorf. And that's exactly what happens. So they manipulate Clink into making that call. And Clink then makes the call and goes, there, I've put paid to your horrible bribery plan. That's one in your (laughs) eye. I'm the man. And uh, yes, Uh, then... Too good for them. (laughs) Cut to a, a very short while later and you hear a massive explosion. And uh, they sort of all go, crikey, blimey, I'll you know, be happy when this uh, this construction business is over. And Hogan says to Clink, I've got a feeling that there won't be any more explosions after this. And Clink says, how do you how do you know that, Hogan? And he goes, oh, I've just got a feeling, that's all. <laughs> and um, then you more or less get to the end of the episode, but there's one last scene where they're outside on parade again, uh, another roll call. And Clink has to inform the prisoners the Adolf Hitler bridge has been destroyed, to which all the men cheer. Um, now, Clink 
says he wants volunteers to help rebuild the bridge. Uh, <laughs> and all the men are saying, no way. Boo. Up yours, Mr. German person. Uh, but Up yours, Hogan, friends. <laughs> yeah. Hogan steps forward and says, oh, I'm going to offer my men as volunteers if you reopen our wreck hole. And Clink says, yes. And so all the guys are very unhappy with this. And they're hectoring poor old Hogan. And he goes, boys, 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 it's part of my genius plan to rebuild the bridge with a great new feature of a built-in bomb. And they all go, yes. And it's the end of the episode. Then they realise that means they've got to spend another five days painting the... <laughs> Some other building. <laughs> the ammunition's bunker again. The end. The end. <laughs> ah. So, yes, as with all these, it's like whenever we cover, say, Faulty Towers or something like that, with these very involved plots, we have these very long synopsis. All right, Steve, so with that synopsis over and done with... Phew. Oh, um, I think we should take another little break yeah. and uh, hear from our friends over at the Sado podcast. Yep. So you're a fan of sitcoms, eh? Well, it's a pretty surefire thing if you're listening to the sitcom showdown. Well, the guys have been kind enough to give us a tick to tell you about another podcast you might like. Yes, we're the show hosts for the sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive, a podcast that goes way beyond obsessive when it comes to our favourite British sitcoms of days gone by. Oh, God, yes. We go the full hog and deep dive week by week every single episode made of the sitcoms we choose for the show. And season one... Series one, Ben, we are British. Yes, sorry, um, series one is all about the good life. We're looking at every episode, the fashions, the gin consumption, the sneaky cigarette theft, the swinging, sustainability, and of course, the superb writing and performances. Yes, and when we're finished, it'll be on to another old classic to kick the arse out of, won't it? Yes, maybe the young ones? Or porridge, maybe? The world is our lobster. So join us and take a deep dive into all things The Good Life with the sitcom archive Deep Dive Overdrive podcast. Or Sado. Because basically we're a couple of Sados. Hmm, speak for yourself. Well, I like that promo. That was a very good promo. Yeah. Ah. Maybe they can do one for us. Yeah, well, look, it is better than anything we would have come (laughs) up with. But um, yes, let's find out what we thought about Hogan's Heroes. Yeah. It seems like they, they spent a long time on the come up with the formula chlorine for the gas. ammonia ammonia mm. or chlorine or whatever it is and then that whole idea gets canned yeah so could they have just cut 10 minutes out of this script and filled it with something else they could have done yes i felt yes. like it was a complete dead end right i mean yeah. I, overall i enjoyed the i enjoyed the total package but it did yeah. feel like there was a massive chunk of it that just led nowhere yeah that's right because with the motorcycle thing there was a huge spanner in the works, but they found a way around it. Yep. But with the chlorine gas thing, they spent 10 minutes on it and then abandoned it. It just stopped. Yeah. Hmm. We got some good laughs out of it. Yeah. Is that the reason they did that? Because they kept it in because they wanted to get all the gags out of it. Hmm. Don't know. Anyway, that's just an observation. You know, yeah. a lot of our favorite sitcom episodes are ones where they're very economically oh, yeah. making it use of every minute of screen time. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And maybe and they then... would have woven another subplot or something like that. In with the main story or something like that. No, no, that totally makes sense. Do you think, uh, as some sort of defence, that being so early in the sitcom... The evolution of the sitcom. The evolution of the sitcom, which has probably been going for, I don't know, 20 years at that point. Yep. Maybe less. Who knows? This is just one of those things. And then later writers would learn from that. And 10 years later, when Faulty Towers is being written, they don't make such mistakes. Yep. Don't know. Oh, yeah. It didn't detract from my enjoyment of it. Oh, good. Oh. It's just quite mm. noticeable. It is a bit noticeable. Because I got, I got to the end, or well, that scene where they said, right, we're going to have to find another way to do this. And I was like, oh, I feel a bit let down. <laughs> yeah. They didn't rise to the challenge somehow. Yeah. Um, Fair point. The tone of this show is quite interesting because it is, although the Germans are a bit farcical, there's quite a serious undertone to it, really. Mm. You see that in the, the discipline of Hogan's men in the way they deal with the missions that he's giving them and stuff like that. But also, I mean, they blew that German motorbike career to smithereens, right? And didn't think twice about it. They're all cheering about it and everything like that. Yeah. Would that happen in a sitcom these days? No. No. I don't think it would. I found that quite interesting. Yeah. It's a funny show, but it's also got a bit of a serious side to it. Um, There's a couple of initial observations. Right. What have you got over there? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, we can probably get into gags and then because Mm -hmm. the observations lead us down that serious road to the end of the show where we pass judgment. Okay. 
But um, after the first explosion, because Kinch and Hogan are still in the tunnel because they've been in there helping Carter set up for these experiments. And as they're leaving, they're walking through the tunnel <laughs> and behind them all you see is... Yeah. And they duck for cover. And after the dust stops raining down, Hogan goes, Carter, Carter, are you all right? And Carter sort of comes out waving all the dust away from him. And he goes, it's all right. And, you know, sir, don't worry. You've got to expect a few little explosions. <laughs> and he goes, oh. Hogan says, all right, no worries. Now, uh, I hope you've got insurance. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where are you going to get insurance in a yeah. prison camp in the middle of Yes, that's the joke in it. There's another explosion. This is at the end of the experimentation. Um, and it's a massive explosion. And they're in the office and they're just thinking, this is getting really bad. And New Kirk goes, blimey, Gov, that one loosened one of my feelings. And Hogan <laughs> instantly just says, yeah, yeah, right to your prime minister. <laughs> no sympathy at all. No. Um, but it was it was very funny. And I, that's sort of the international flavor of the show. You know, I think that's pretty cool. Yep. And after all these conversations with people on the phone... Clink always forgets to say Heil Hitler, and the other person on the other end has clearly said it, and Clink just goes, yes, 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 Heil Hitler. <laughs> oh. Yeah, he'd forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah. I just want to get this done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, it's classic. Um, have you got any gags? And before you answer that, Steve, I think this is a beautiful example of one of those shows where you've got to pay such close mm. attention that if you stop to write down a gag while we're watching it, and this is why I we agree didn't write anything Absolutely. down. You lose plot points, and that's why neither of us have got many notes. Here's one which you didn't mention. Yeah. Early in the show, where they're out do- outdoors at night, and they're going to form their arrowhead out of lighters or whatever they're doing to direct the plane. When the guys, what do they call it, fall fall out or fall... When they're kind of dismissed, so they hang go around at or ease and then at dismissed. Ease, yeah, 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 yeah. So Hogan what? says, at ease, and then he yeah. walks over to Clink and kind of... Who had been talking directly to the... To the guys, mm. he kind of grabs him and manoeuvres him around so he's facing the opposite yeah. direction and he can't see what the guys are doing. Yeah, so Clink now them. has his back to the men, yeah. whereas he was facing them, to, so he can't see them in arrow format. No, yes, I understand what you're saying there. Yep, I thought he did that very nicely. Yeah, and that's just a microcosm of how he manipulates Clink all the time. Yeah, well, the um, what do you call it? The reverse psychology is key, isn't it? Oh, totally. Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to do this. No way. <laughs> Yes, you will. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Seeing yep. as you're making us. Right, any more gags? I don't have any more gags. Oh, I've got another gag. <laughs> so this is um, Clink going absolutely off his nana uh, when the bribe situation comes up. He goes, Hogan, I'm going to throw all of your men in the cooler myself for the rest of the war. And he goes, no, even after the war. And he said, no, <laughs> after the war. even if we lose the war, <laughs> they're still going to be in the cooler. What? <laughs> and he's just... <laughs> <laughs> completely. Uh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> what, are you looking at me mystified? Yeah. Oh, I'm mystified <laughs> because I can't remember it. Oh, really? Uh, I was no. probably taking a note when that one Yeah, happened. I reckon you were taking a note when that one was happened. Yep. Well, even after the war and even if we lose the war. Uh, he's very determined. Do you want to talk about the sign warning of explosions due yes. to construction being written in English? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And all the, the insults they painted on the side of the... Yeah. I mean, you don't even think about this, right? <laughs> Until someone points it Until out. Until someone points it out. Yeah. Uh, someone pointed good... out, Steve-O, and I, Jane got a good laugh when I told her this, mm. that if you look carefully, and I forgot to look, that in the office behind Colonel Clink, there's a map on the wall, and the map has East and West Germany on it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Whoa. Uh, Fantastic. But yes, we didn't write down a lot of gags. There are gags, but I think a lot of the humour in this show is from the the charm of all the cast members. And this includes the guys playing the Germans. The characters have charm, and if not charm, then humour. And I think that, like, although they're all in massive amounts of danger and what they're doing is quite perilous, they have a lot of fun while they're doing it. You know, they take it seriously, but there's plenty of bants, and, you know, they're having a good time. And I think you get carried on that wave of charm and enthusiasm and, and all that sort of stuff as well. So I think yep. that's included in the fun. And I was thinking about Renee in a lower low, who's in just as many perilous situations and mm. completely crazy plans. And he's in as just as much danger, but he's not having any fun 
with any of it. And I think the humor comes from his suffering. You know what I mean? Because Rene, he's got his cafe and his affairs he's having, and he's got a lot to lose. Whereas Hogan's boys have not got anything to lose because they're already in a Nazi prison camp. Yeah, but Rene, isn't he creating, like he's like you said, he's married, yep. and he's got two affairs going on at the same time. At least. At least. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's complicated his own life, and then he he's has. got all this war business and spies yeah, but that, and stuff going thing, on on top of that. All these resistance groups insist on using his cafe as a base yep. and they say, if you don't cooperate with us, then we're going to sell you out to such and such. It's good so for business gonna, though, isn't it? Yeah. So the Germans are in there wanting him to do stuff for them. The resistance are in there wanting him to do stuff for them. The communist resistance are in there wanting Red A to do stuff for them. Plus he's got to run the cafe and carry on all these affairs. His yep. stress levels are through the roof. Absolutely. Ah, anyway, um, so I wanted to see if Hogan's Heroes was going to measure up with some of Britain's best love sitcoms, which mm. obviously with this kind of thing. Army. Yeah, World War Two um, theme. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, the World War Two theme sitcoms. So Dad's Army and a lower low, and I'm going to throw in just World War stuff. I'm going to throw in Blackout of Goes Forth because they get like some of the world's best humour out of the same war situation. Mm. You know, and I thought, how is this going to measure up? to those sitcoms mm. especially considering i've only got four episodes to choose from <laughs> and i just thought you know it's not too bad and the world war comedies benefit from having what you mentioned which is that underlying seriousness sort of adds to it somehow but you've got the life or death stuff and it's the humor in the face of having your life hanging by a thread so it's valuable humor and, uh, you know, the, the interactions between the characters can be quite earnest without being awkward. And I think, you know, there's a lot at stake, Steve, because you're always talking about stakes. Mm. So sitcoms set in the current day in someone's house or an office, they don't quite carry as much weight. And I mean, what's the worst that can happen in your modern sitcom where it's people sitting around on the couch? Yeah. Not much. It would have been even better if they'd said, uh, we know of this plan to move a bunch of German forces in this certain direction and yep. that's going to happen on such and such, such, and such a date and we, they're going to cross the Adolf Hitler Bridge and if we can yeah. destroy the bridge, they're not going to be able to yeah. go on and do whatever they're planning to do. Totally. That would have upped the stakes. Yeah. That would have been even better. You're right. And on this DVD, one of the other episodes, is there's this big time officer who's come passing through and he stays at the camp and he's got a briefcase sort of um, handcuffed to his arm yep. with valuable microfilm in it Ooh. and blah, blah, blah. Sounds and exciting. How about they have to set up some sort of dinner party so that the person has his briefcase under the table and then they have to get a reason to get under the table and have new Kirk Lock pick his way into the car. Oh, no. It's a right palaver. So, yeah, maybe maybe you would have enjoyed that one. They, they definitely use that later on. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what, what other comments have you got, Steve? Well, the... We've talked a bit about the fact that they didn't continue on the plot line with the blight using the ammonia and whatnot, mm. but the whole plan was so implausible. Mm. Like I was kind of on board until they'd sourced all the gunpowder they needed out of these bullets, yep. and then it's revealed that their planned method of execution is to set the timer for the bo the bomb like twenty five minutes, yep, or forty five minutes or whatever it is in advance, yep, and hope that. <laughs> They've done all their calculations correctly so that... That seven-second span when he's yeah, crossing like, the... This bridge is only 50 metres across or something like that. They're going to have to time it to the millisecond yep. to get it right. Yes. There's no getting around what point you're making. That That is how it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, these guys, they've put three weeks' worth of effort and put their lives on the line to get it to this point. And it seems yeah. like it's just a wing and a prayer from this point on. Pretty much. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And then uh, my instinct to defend them, I'd say, well, what else are they going to do? Especially with no recall. Well, I thought they'd sneak out. They'd my, be bored. my first thought was they made the bomb. They're going to sneak out at night. Yep. Put the bomb on the bridge, set the yep. timer for two minutes, and then run off the bridge. Yeah. So th or even give set it for two hours, which gives them enough time to come back to the camp. Yep. But maybe, mm. I don't know, maybe that's not as funny. And maybe there were filming restrictions. I mean, the, we did get the whole brilliant scene of uh, Hogan manipulating Clink to make the phone call. Yep. And did you say how he was telling him during the phone call? Oh, it's, No, uh, I didn't say that. No. It's guard post number seven. 
And then kind of goes, and uh, yes, ring guard post number seven. So he's essentially giving him directions to, as to what to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh. This guy's on the phone. Uh, it was a very funny. And then Kling says, did you say something while I was on the phone, Hogan? No, no. <laughs> I noticed that another thing which seems a bit strange, mm-hmm. maybe, is that um, in the scenes where there's multiple guys together, they're all like got their arms around each other and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's all very chummy. It's all very chummy. I was thinking to myself, are they just, can they not figure out how to get shoot the multiple people into a shot here and they're just making life easy for themselves or is there some, yeah. some other, are they communicating the camaraderie or yeah, I think the closeness of the characters or what? Yeah. I reckon that's exactly what it is. Because almost every scene, they've got their arms around each other and all this sort of doing stuff. Doing all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. I reckon you're right on both counts. It was quite noticeable. So one, especially when they're in the hut as yeah. well. And so Newkirk goes over to Schultzy and he's, you know, snuggling up to Schultzy and guiding him over to the table and then leaning on his shoulder and doing all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, I think I've just about reached the end of my notes. Well, I think, yeah. So in a nutshell, I had, I had vague memories of Hogan's Heroes being a good show, uh, but I've watched a lot of other shows I had vague memories of being good and they do not live up to Ooh, okay. the memories, you know, Metal Mickey for a start, which is atrocious. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was tippity tops. Um, but no, this this absolutely lived up to thing. I think a lot of it rests on the great cast. Um, they're just bloody superb. But I can't tell if it's well written or not, because, you know, when you've got a British sitcom and it's the same writer quite often, mm-hmm. you can assume a through line of consistency, whereas this would have different writers for every episode. And yep. then you can't... If I'd gotten a different DVD, would it have been garbage? And because it's the first season... Um, it hasn't gotten too ridiculous, but let's say it was season six and they've done every plot eight times yep. with subtle twists, would it then just be completely ridiculously over the top? Anyway, let's not think about any of that. I just reckon uh, the cast is fantastic. Uh, it's not too ridiculous and I was quite impressed. So Werner Klemperer, he does steal the show as Clink. Um, Schultz yep. is a classic character. It's those two and their catchphrases that we remember when we think of Hogan's Heroes, I reckon. Um, Bob Crane plays Hogan pretty much perfectly. Uh, I can't imagine anyone else in the role. Um, and Hogan, so he's brave, but he's smug and overconfident, uh, but he's also super smart and decisive. But, you know, he does, with his cheekiness, he, he does come close to getting rumbled sometimes because he can't help mm-hmm. making a smart-ass remark to <laughs> Colonel Clink or something like that. And again, I keep coming back to Clink, right? So I think... There's episodes where the writers make Clink a dumbass, whereas he's not. And mm. those episodes aren't as good because it takes away from the threat. So Clink, I feel, is smart, but he's insecure. He's too trusting. He is a fool, but he's not stupid. And it's easy to dupe a stupid person, as we see with Schultz. Mm. But if you make Clink a stupid person, it it makes it too easy to dupe him. And it takes away from the brilliant psychological tricks and and charm that Hogan has to use. Um, So I think in other episodes where he's not written well, then it can suffer a bit. Um, But yeah, like it's harder and more artful to manipulate someone's personality traits, which is Clink's insecurities and stuff, um, to get what you want. And when they do it well, it's just absolutely superb. Um, So the best episodes of Hogan's Heroes aren't, you know, where there's stupid Germans... um, it's, you know, more episodes like this where you exploit their personalities. But, yeah, I just think it, um, I was impressed. I think it's a classic sitcom. And this early episode gives you a textbook example of what Hogan's Heroes does and what it's all about. I'm not going to disagree with any of that. No, I think um, all the performances were really good. Uh, we talked about how the plot could have been tuned up a bit, maybe. But, yeah, yeah like you're saying, it was early in the days of the, the sitcom, sitcom, so it was form. still... Yeah. Still coming along in terms of the way we do things these days, so. Yep. No, but mm. still very enjoyable. Oh, good. Are you nominating this for the Hall oh, of Fame? Oh, no, yeah, because this is a standard episode. Right. So, again, it's not like I'm coming in here with one of my favourite sitcoms of all time. I'm, I'm coming in here with a $1 DVD I bought, <laughs> and I had four episodes to choose from. So, if it doesn't make it into the Hall of Fame, you won't hear much complaint from me, uh, but it's been a pleasure to be able to nominate it and say, you know, I was I was highly impressed by how well Hogan's Heroes holds up, and, yep. and I did enjoy it as much as I do watching... It ain't our fault, Mum, or some of the Dad's Army episodes, or even a lower low, which I love. Yep. So it was cool. Yeah. 
Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm sure if there's six seasons of and hundred and how many episodes was it? Hundred and thirty eight or something. Hundred and thirty eight. I think we can find maybe one that's better than better than this. <laughs> so I wouldn't I'd say so. Wouldn't say it's five star, but enjoyable nonetheless. Oh good, good, good. Ah yeah, well that gives us an opportunity to bring another one up. But I'm not watching another hundred and thirty four episodes <laughs> of Hogan's Heroes to find that episode. So perhaps if the listener can nominate one. Yes, if well, anyone wants to suggest to a- one. Yeah, there could be a list online of, you know, top five best Hogan's heroes. Uh, IMDb always has a rating of the highest Ah. rating for episodes. So you could just cheat and use that. But yes, if anyone listener wants to send us a suggestion, we'd be happy to check it out. Cool. Thanks, Jeff, for bringing Hogan's heroes along. And we'll be back. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We'll be back next month for some Christmas episodes. Yes, yes. Yes. We're looking forward to that. And we'll see you next month, listeners. Yes. Jingle all the way. Yes. Cheerio. Ta-ta. Join us next time on Sitcom Showdown when we'll be putting another five-star episode under the microscope. And in the meantime, you can contact us with feedback on Facebook, Twitter at Sitcom Showdown, or by email sitcomshowdown at gmail.com. 